Wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart There's a light in the valley of death now for me Since Jesus came into my heart And the gates of the city beyond I can see Since Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I shall go there to dwell in that city I know, since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Floods of joy o'er my soul Like the sea billows roll Since Jesus came into my heart Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer. I think of Him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent. His love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight. Who lovingly guardeth my footsteps And giveth me songs in the night Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever I am Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus Oh, how I love Jesus, because
because he first loved me. Sunshine and rain, harvest and grain, he's my friend. Jesus is all the world to me, I want no better friend. I trust him now, I'll trust him when life's fleeting day shall end. Beautiful life with such a friend, beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. Too deeply for mirth and song As the burdens press And the cares distress And 
the way grows weary and long. Oh, yes, He cares. I know He cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the day Bibles this morning. I want to speak to you on the subject of grace, only uh, from a different point of view. Paul uses this phrase uh, of a frustrated grace. Interesting uh, phraseology of, of grace. Everybody loves grace. Uh, what's the definition of, well, biblically, divine grace is God giving a favor uh, to us that we don't deserve. In other words, it's unmerited favor on behalf of God's part. And we do favors for people as well. We show grace to people all the time. Uh, you may give a person a, a gift and they don't deserve it, but you do it because of your kindness. Uh, you just want to do something special for them. And you'd like to think they appreciate it. Uh, have you seen Christmas time? Sometimes you give these gifts to your kids. And, uh, and it's all grace. I mean, you don't have to do it. But you do it because you just want to make their day. And they just rip through those presents, throw them. They don't have any idea where they came from. 
Uh, they, they get through all the pile of gifts and they say, isn't there anything more? And you're thinking, wow, you just went through a bunch of grace and it's almost like uh, you didn't appreciate at all any of the grace that you just got. Um, but you can also frustrate grace. Well, let's read the verse, Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, Paul says. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So he gives us a truth, he gives us a principle, which we'll touch on in just a moment. But he says, uh, God gives us grace and salvation. He saves us. He, he doesn't have to do that. He gives us a home in heaven. He doesn't have to do that. And he made a plan of salvation where it doesn't cost us a thing. Why would I want to frustrate that grace that has been so willingly given to me? Is really what he's saying. I was reading about Clara Barton. She was a Red Cross worker in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Colonel Theodore Roosevelt came to her one day wanting to buy some supplies for his men. Uh, she said, you can't buy them, sir. How then can I get them, he asked. She said, just ask for them, Colonel. So um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt smiled. And he says, I, then I do ask for them. With all the earnestness of my heart, he then received his request. Simply grace. Um, she says, I, you, you can't buy them. I'm just going to give them to you. But you've got to ask. And so he did, and, and he received. Uh, if you uh, earn a, a, a weekly salary, and you go to work all week, you work hard, and you get your weekly salary, and you're paid <clears throat> what you earned, then you received your just reward. But should you be sick that week, uh, something came up where you had to miss work. You just couldn't make it. And at the end of the week, you went to get your paycheck, and they gave you the full amount. There's a certain amount of grace there. Now, we may say, well, we deserve it because we put so much time in or whatever, but the fact is, it's still grace. You got it without working for it. And we really do need to consider being appreciative for all the grace that we do receive, even from a human standpoint, uh, as well as, of course, the grace that God gives us. Divine grace, of course, we're all familiar with divine grace. That means that we're sinners. And probably before we came to know Christ as our personal Savior, we really spurned God's love. We knew he loved us. We'd heard the stories he loved us and that he had done all this for us. And yet we rejected the stories that we'd heard. We rejected Jesus Christ himself. We resisted the Spirit of God working in our hearts, uh, trying to draw us to the Lord Jesus Christ. We deserve to be condemned. And yet, God reached us through a word, through a, a friend, a neighbor, through the preaching, through the reading of his word. And God reached us, and uh, we reached out and asked Christ to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us, to take us to heaven, and he saved us. It's all grace. It's all God showing us favor, doing something for us that we don't deserve. That's simply grace. And I love the stories of grace. Galatians is all about grace. And uh, we thank God for grace because you can't purchase your salvation. An example of frustrating grace would be a father who has a business and his son's getting older and getting college age and he goes to his son and says, Son, I'd really love for you someday to take over the business. Grace. But I want you to go to college. I want you to learn all the business um, information that you can uh, acquire but don't worry I will pay for your college grace I will get you a car I'll get you some transportation while you're at college grace I'll pay for all your textbooks grace I'll see that financially you make it through uh, but I, I want you to go and do your very best and come back and take over the company grace the sun lasts about 30 days drops out of school um, kicks around for a while, tries to find some odd and end job, 
doesn't make anything his, with his life. He runs into some people that he shouldn't run into. They drag him down further, and he becomes just really nothing of any value. And the father is frustrated over that. He's paid the money. He had great expectations. He offered his son everything, and his son throws it away. That's frustrating grace. God does the same thing to us, and we often frustrate the grace of God. All that you and I have in this world is because of the grace of Almighty God. Every day he's blessing you. He's blessing me. Uh, he provides for us. He protects us. He watches over us. Uh, and we don't know exactly how much he does protect us and keep us from harm and evil. But all the while, he's watching over us and guarding us, especially his children. And so often, we frustrate the very grace of God. Well, what's it mean to frustrate God's grace? Well, it means to disappoint him. How often do we disappoint the Lord? I don't know that we really think about it. But just as that son disappointed that father, we can do the same thing with God Almighty who's trying so hard to develop us and to make us into something wonderful and we so fight against it. So it's one thing we disappoint him. To frustrate means that you battle against it. Uh, you balk at, at what's given to you. you. You actually bring to nothing the grace that has been extended to us. And it's sad. And so Paul uses this, this interesting term here. He says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I don't want in any way to try to disappoint him. I don't want to fight against his grace. Matter of fact, I want to accept and have a part in his grace. And let me just share with you three or four things here this morning as to how we can and how people do frustrate the grace of God. I don't know about you, but I have to guard against it because things frustrate me. I was sitting down here going to make going down the highway here, you know, down at the light down here on the Frederick. And the line's backed up. The stoplight's red. And so I'm sitting there, and there's Burger King. The car wants out. So, okay, I'll leave it enough space here because I have to sit here anyway and wait for the light. And so here's the car wants out. I left plenty of room. And they wait. And they wait. And I'm waving. Here's your time. This is your moment. And they sit there. Come on, come on, come on. The light turns green. Traffic starts moving. Now I'm not going to wait here just a few more seconds. You're going to make your move. Come on, this, I'm giving you grace. They didn't take it. Fine. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. I thought you wanted out. And so you run into little things like that. You try to do things for people, and they almost fight against what you're trying to do. And you just finally say, oh, I've had it. And I can imagine God doing that same thing, feeling the, the same feelings that you and I feel. God says, come on. I'm trying to help you here. Act upon this. And we don't. Number one, God's grace is frustrated God's grace is frustrated when sinners substitute works in place of grace to get them to heaven. And this is exactly what Paul's talking about here. It frustrates God when he says, I want to give you salvation. It's free. There's no charge to it. Uh, I've, I've put all the payment on my son, Jesus Christ. And if you accept him as your personal Savior, I'll take you to heaven when you die. I'll forgive you of your sins. I'll cleanse you. Why wouldn't a person take that? But they don't. The vast multitudes don't. And you think, how can that be? Notice what Paul says in verse 22. I do not frustrate the grace of God. Well, how could he do that? He says, for if righteous, righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. In other words... The law can't save anybody. Keeping the law, keeping commandments, 
trying to do good, trying to merit God's favor. He says, if that, if that could save a person, then Jesus Christ died in vain. So he says, why would, it's foolish for me to trust in the law to save me when it can't. Jesus Christ is the only person who can save me. Why would I frustrate God's grace, who's offering me freedom, a cleansing, a forgiveness, eternity in heaven? Why would I turn that down and say, I'm sorry, God, I'd rather try to work my way to heaven. I'm going to just try to keep the law and, and hope that I do good enough that you would somehow open the doors of heaven. God says, I can't do that. The law can't save anyone. But you, everybody, so many people do that. There are so many that you talk to are trying to get to heaven by their good works. And maybe, well, they do understand it. They really do believe that somehow they're good enough to go to heaven. But they're not. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. In other words, you can't do it yourself. It is the gift of God. It's grace. Not of works. You can't make it any clearer than that. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. So no one's going to get to heaven and say, let me tell you how I got here. I, I was better than you. No one can be better than the next person in heaven because no one can be that good. Jesus is the only perfect one, amen? And that's why he was, the, he was the sacrifice that satisfied the Father because he was perfect in every regard. Romans 11.6 says this, And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. That's a great verse, Romans 11.6. If it's by grace, and it is, then it's no more works. You can't add works to it. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And, of course, back in those days, the book of Galatians, uh, you go ahead and go on down to chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? And they were trying to add works to it. Many religions do that today. Oh, it's okay to trust Jesus as your personal Savior, but to get to heaven, you have to follow this and this, and you have to do this and this, 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 this to get you to heaven. Well, how frustrating is that? Because you don't know whether you did it good enough or not. Now, as a Christian, and we're talking about the Bible, I'm not saying God does not expect you to live a holy life. He expects you to live a holy life, but you can't live a holy enough life to get to heaven. Once I'm saved and you're saved, then you begin to live. Jesus Christ begins to live his life through you, and it takes on the characteristics of holiness. You want to live a more holy life, not to earn your way to heaven, but to glorify God and say, God, thank you for your grace. Appreciate it. And I want to live for you, and I want to live like Jesus wants me to live. And that's appreciating the grace of God. But Paul says, I'm not going to frustrate, I'm not going to disappoint God's grace by trying to go back and somehow work my way to heaven. You can't do it. And so if you're here today and you're hoping that there's some good thing about you that's going to get you to heaven, it's not going to happen. Else Jesus would never have had to die on the cross. He did it all. When he says, Father, it is finished, he meant what he said. He meant the whole plan, the whole uh, payment for sin had been paid with his death upon the cross. In other words, I can't add anything to something that's been finished. If it's finished, it's finished. Paul says to do otherwise is to frustrate grace. Secondly, grace, God's grace can be frustrated when Christians give all their attention to the things of the world. You know, when God saves us, 
he really wants to begin a work in our lives to make us into something much better than what we are. Once we get a clear look at ourselves, and you look at yourself honestly, and you come to the conclusion that in and of yourself you have, there's nothing about you that is appealing to God. It's only what God can make you that gives you any value. See, God already has a plan for your life. And he wants to shape you and mold you into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to take this old person that we are, with all of our bad thoughts, our old bad habits, goals, and all that. And he wants to transform those things and give us divine goals. I mean, we want to glorify God for the first time in our lives. And to fight against that. And that's all grace. God says, hey, listen, I will do this for you. You are my workmanship unto good works. That I before ordained that you should walk in them. In other words, I have a plan and I'm going to, I'm going to bring about holy and righteous works out of your life, out of this old vessel that's so unclean. And I'm going to transform it and make something beautiful and clean out of it. That's God's grace at work. And for me to fight against that frustrates God's grace. God says, simply surrender to me. Yield to me. Let me mold you and shape you like I want to, and I can make something beautiful out of your life. Colossians 3, 2 says, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Once I become a Christian, all of a sudden I have different thoughts. And that is I have heavenly thoughts. I now am set my affection on things above. What's that mean? I care about what God thinks. I want to now please him. Before, I was just concerned about earthly things. How to take care of myself how to earn a living, how to buy things, how to make my life comfortable, uh, maybe help a few people, whatever. But I was concerned about earthly things. Now I'm concerned about heavenly things. I want other people to go to heaven. How does God think of me? What does God want me to do today? How does God want me to act today? See, before you're saved, you don't think like that. We're to set our affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. And the sad thing is so many people are so still earthly-minded. Well, you've heard the old statement, uh, you're so earthly-minded, you're no heavenly good. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth in that statement. I'm just still going about my thing, doing my thing, and God can't do a thing with them. There's no grace there. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they erred from the faith, pierced themselves through with many arrows, with many sorrows. And if we're not careful, this is the world's mindset. How much more money can I make so that I can have more? They live for that. They're driven by that. That's their goal in life rather than to set their affection on things above. I want to lay up my treasure in heaven, not upon this earth. God wants to do so much for us, and it's all grace that he's giving to us. He gives us the Holy Spirit. doesn't have to, but he does, to help us through this life so that we can live for him, serve him. Instead of... Uh, concentrating on the things of this world which are going to pass away when we die let's think about getting some other people to heaven with us let's make sure we're going to go to heaven let's reach our family for Christ let's, uh, let's lay up some rewards in heaven I mean let's become like whatever God wants to make us let's just submit to him and let God do his grace in our lives A worldly man showed a Christian his estate. It was a mansion. It was beautiful. And from the mansion, you could look out at the countryside, far as you could see. 
And this uh, young Christian said, boy, this is just beautiful. And the man, of course, beamed. And he says, everything you see is mine. He says, once I was a poor boy, but I worked and I saved and I invested, and now it's all mine. The Christian said, but this is all on earth. What do you have up there? And the man says, up where? And the Christian says, up there in heaven. What do you have up in heaven? Well, the businessman said, well, I'm afraid I've been too busy building what I have here to be concerned about what's up there. With which the Christian responded, then one day you will have to leave it all here. You can't take anything with you. And if you go to heaven, you'll have nothing there. That makes you a beggar. And the guy was just shocked. He never, he never even gave it a moment's thought. And he thought, all the while, I thought I had the, everything. But I'm going to leave all this, and then I have nothing. You know, a lot of people are going to be surprised when they get to heaven. It's as though they think everybody's going to be equal in heaven. Not so. You and I have so many years to live here. We all have the same amount of time, some fewer years, some more years. But regardless, it's what we do with our life here that's going to determine what we're going to be in heaven. Jesus says, matter of fact, you were faithful over a few. I'll make you rule over many things in heaven. Some I'll give you a rulership over five cities, some over ten cities. Why? Why the difference? Because of their faithfulness here. They served God faithfully. They accepted his grace and allowed God to work in their life and make them what God wanted them to be. And God says, I'm going to reward you handsomely for that. You want to be busy serving God, and the way to do that is set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Thirdly, God's grace is frustrated when parents neglect the spiritual welfare of their children. Now, God gave us children, you that have children, and it's always a wonderful day. We celebrate the Perrys even today for their beautiful baby. And all of us that have had children comes with it responsibility. Now, God doesn't leave us on, on our own. Thank God for the word of God. He gives us the word of God. Again, that's grace. He says, I'm going to give you a manual on how to train your children. I wouldn't have to do it. I could just leave it to your feelings and what society says. But no, I'm going to give you a book called the word of God. And it's going to instruct you how to raise your children. And he tells you how to train them. He says, uh, train them in the word of God, study the scriptures, uh, train up a child the way he should go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. He says, there comes a responsibility, but I'll be with you. I will help you. And many people do not take advantage of it. God says, I'm going to give you a church. And there you can take your child. And the, the Sunday school teachers are going to love that child. And they're going to teach them the word of God. And they're going to teach those children how much God loves them. And that how Jesus was willing to die on the cross for their sins. And how he wants to take them to heaven someday. They're going to be just surrounded in love from God. They're going to be taught that. And they're going to be taught that the Bible is accurate and it's true. They, they can follow that in life. They will be able to know what's right and what's wrong. I give you all of that. It's, it's my present to you. Don't frustrate it. Don't take it for granted or discard it. Don't fight against it. Embrace it. And yet so few do. And that's what's sad. There's how many? You, you couldn't even name them. they give you a good reason in their mind, why it's not important to go to church today. Now, some are sick, can't get out. I understand that. And God knows those individuals and those circumstances. But you know as well as I do, 
There's a whole bunch that are frustrating the grace of God today because they're not in the house of God. And God set that up to be a blessing to those people. And they're discarding it. And they're disappointing God. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, God said. Don't, don't, don't neglect that. Don't frustrate that grace that I've given you. Come be around the word of God. Sing hymns and songs of praise. Uh, get into the word of God and say, here's what God wants out of my life. Here's what he wants to do in my life. Learn and grow and develop and let God do his work in your life. Let me challenge the parents to act upon that. You have a wonderful responsibility to train your children right. In 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul writes Timothy and says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Isn't that wonderful? That from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. How is that possible? His mom taught him. His grandmother taught him. The Bible tells us that. They were faithful in doing their job to teach him the Holy Scriptures. What was the benefit? What's it say? From a child that has known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. How did he know all of that? Because his parents taught him the Word of God, and the Word of God pointed him to Jesus Christ for his salvation. There's the benefits of grace. God gives us all this information, and then he says, if you act upon it, I will save you and take you to heaven someday. You'll be so glad that you did, and you didn't frustrate me and fight against it and try to bring to naught the grace that I'm trying to bless you with. You know, it's so easy to make promises to God, isn't it? And then not keep them. And maybe we've all been guilty of it. But we have to guard ourselves. When God gets you out of a jam, he comes through big time for you and says, Oh God, thank you. Man, I'm going to serve you from now on. I mean, I'm going to be faithful to the end of my days. And that lasts for two weeks. God says, I'm here to do you good. I want to bless you. I want to pour my grace out on you. But to reject what I'm trying to do for you is simply to frustrate, and probably we frustrate God. How sad it is. Lastly, God's grace is frustrated when Christians operate their lives in the flesh. There's a lot of influences on the Christian life today. The world pulls on you and me all the time. Television. I mean, it's, uh, you're not going to get much out of television. I should have brought the article. I didn't think about it, but I read an article the, the other day. Some, somebody who's really high up, <clears throat> he said, uh, he says, Hollywood and their music you'd be amazed at how occultic it is. He says they're deeply entrenched in it. This, I was amazed that the guy would come out of his own peers and say this. He says there's so much satanic influence in the entertainment world today in America. And there is. People don't know it. And I, I watched a, a 15-minute little summary on, uh, on, on YouTube the other day, and I'll show it sometimes, especially to our young people. One after another, he just showed the entertainer, both the singers and Hollywood actors and actresses. Each one of them, for 15 minutes, probably not more than 30 seconds apiece, had that many people saying, I sold my soul to the devil. I sold my soul to the devil to make the success that I am today. <clears throat> and so that's their, that's their story. But I'm saying this, that that is an influence on people who are trying to be good, on our young people that we're trying to grow them up in a Christ-like fashion. They have that kind of an influence out there pulling on them constantly. 
through the entertainment field and through the music field. Very strong pulls on their life. And it can reach adults as well. I'm saying to you that the world is evil. And it's doing everything in its power to cause the Christian to operate in the flesh. And that is the sinful humanity part of our lives where we will just go out and do things that God doesn't want us to do. And that's why it's so hard, seemingly, for Christians to live a godly and wholesome life today. And yet God, again, has equipped us. The Holy Spirit comes into your life, my life, to empower us to fight against the devil. Matter of fact, you're in Galatians. Just go to the uh, next page over, chapter 5. And it says in verse 16, This I say, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And so you have this battle. The Spirit says, I'm going to empower you not to live a sinful life. Verse 16, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And as you, you won't do these things if you walk in the power of the Spirit. Verse 17, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So he says this battle goes on in your life. And it does. We all know that. But Satan's getting stronger and stronger and stronger. He has far more influence today. Has more tools to use. The entertainment value is all around us. We're inundated with all forms of entertainment to draw us away from God, away from the Bible, away from our church services, away from our Christian friends, our worship of the Lord. All that draws on us. And we frustrate God's grace when he says, listen, I've empowered you to overcome that. You can do it. You can be victorious. You can be an overcomer. I mean, he says, that's why I'm doing all that I'm doing is to allow you to overcome the evil one in this life. Jeremiah 17, 5 says, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departeth from the Lord. When we get to the place where our trust is in ourselves, We've frustrated the grace of God. He wants us so much to put our trust in him and not trust these people out there who seemingly are somebody. They seem to be important. Why? Because they're, they have lots of money, they have fame, they have glamour. You have to understand, that Hollywood crowd, they live in their bubble. They have their Oscars, they have their all their awards, ceremonies, it's all about them. And it's just a, it's a matter, it's like this club. And we uh, award each other these things, and we give accolades to each other, and, and, and all this, and we just do this among ourselves. They're in another world. The Christian is to trust God, not to look to the world for the solutions to life, not to look to some Hollywood star as to how I should live my life because they're living in a different world. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 that we're to trust the Lord with all of our hearts, not to lean to our own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He'll direct our paths. God says, I want you to look to me and if you look to me for directions in life, how to get to heaven, how to raise your family, how to grow spiritually, how to get the greatest blessings from me, trust me. Trust me. And the world says, no, no, no. Don't trust God. Trust us. Trust the government. Trust Hollywood. Trust the music industry. Trust the world's entertainment. All that. Trust me. No, no. It'll let you down every time. You see, when I trust the Lord, I can trust him with my finances. 
Doesn't mean it always excellent. Doesn't mean that I pay every bill on time. Doesn't mean that I have everything that I want, but I can trust him. He will see me through. He will meet my needs. And matter of fact, he often gives me far beyond what I should even have. God has been so good financially. And he'll do the same thing for you. You just give back to him. You help people. You be a blessing to people. You give to his ministry and his work and his missions, missionaries. And God will open the doors of heaven and bless you financially. He'll bless your happiness. The world doesn't understand the Christian. They can't understand how you can be happy without doing the things of the world. How can the world can you be happy just going to church and, 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 and not sinning? <laughs> I mean, there's no fun if you can't sin. Listen, my friend, I have fun every day of my life. I have joy in my life. I know where I'm going. I know who I am, who I belong to. I have a heavenly Father that watches over me and blesses me. Why would I not be happy? You see, that's the kind of joy when you're having financial problems or you're having health problems or you're having marital problems. You can still have joy in those kind of situations where the world can't buy their way out of that mess. And I can trust God with my, my plans in life. Plan doesn't work out the way I wanted it to be, so be it. God must have chosen for it to not to materialize. And I just go with the flow. God, I know that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Steps of a good woman are ordered by the Lord. He's guiding and directing you steps every day. And if you don't, <clears throat> he doesn't direct you to the place that you want to go, that's all right, God. You must have another place for me. Paul says, I want to go over here. God says, no, I want you to go here. Paul says, I'll go to Asia. He says, no, I want you to go to Europe. And he just followed the Lord. And that's what God, I'm saying to you, you can trust him. He will see you through. And the wonderful thing is, when you meet him someday, that's when you're going to see the payday. The payday is coming, my friend. And you're going to say, thank you, Lord. No wonder we'll stand and praise his name when we stand before him because he successfully did what he wanted to do. We didn't frustrate his grace. We surrendered and submitted to him. And God says, come on in. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Stand with me, please.
Dwellers who are ready will be laying burdens down, shaking the dust off all of these trials and exchange them for a crown. In a land where there is no sickness, neither death will come again. We may cry before we come out, but what glory moving in? And we're coming out of this land of sorrow into a land of perfect day. Leaving behind all of this suffering we have known along the way. We have washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We're coming out and moving and moving in. We're coming out of this land of sorrow into a land of perfect day. Leaving behind all of this suffering we have known along the Yeah. 